All right, this has been kind of a little more difficult for me, this passage of Scripture here in the last part of John chapter 5. Jesus used such few words in dealing with the, the man at the beginning with the infirmity. And then he used so many words to talk about who he was. It takes a lot more to explain who Jesus is than it does to explain who a man is. Or to help a man out of his pitiful situation no matter how bad it is. <laughs> Things like that are simple for the Lord. What's difficult is explaining Jesus Christ. Things have changed so drastically in the last few generations to where it's become this personal relationship with Jesus Christ has become so common and and it's gotten to where he's like our rabbit's foot that we carry in our pocket or our little helper, our co-pilot, or, you know, he's just there to help us. He's there to serve us. He's there to rescue us from our troubles. And life's really still about us. We just got him to help us. And the absolute majesty that's unspeakable, we don't even touch it. With all the songs and the hymns that have been written since he came, since the beginning of time. These some of these we just sang here. <clears throat> Be thou exalted. And and we were talking about it the other day. <clears throat> the old hymns, they teach so much there's so much theology, if you want to put it that way. But there's just so much about them that honor and glorify and reveal God in words as best we can. But all that's ever been written, if you put them all together, they haven't even come close to describing what God did <laughs> when He became a man. <laughs> what, he, what was the plan of God? And, and what does it entail? We haven't even scratched the surface and we come and we meet together and we talk about things and and a lot of the preaching and teaching is about practical things for us here in this life and that is, is, is as it should be. That's what the church is here for. It's for the perfecting of the saints and that's why God ordered the church and set it up as He did and local churches and with pastors and teachers and evangelists and there's so much of it. the epistles are a lot written a lot of them are written to the practical things and the problems everyday problems in the churches so we come to church and we ought to get teaching and instruction like that but still Christ should always have preeminence I mean he should always be exalted. We should never get far from that. That ought to be the theme of everything. It ought to be the theme of our life. It ought to be the theme of our talk. Jesus. Yes, sir. His glory. Yes. I've listened to preaching like S.M. Lockridge preaching on my king. I don't know how a man with words could exalt him more. But it's still insufficient. When we stand before him, we're going to look at that and say, Phew, that was kid stuff. I mean, that was shallow. That's what's going on here in the last of this chapter. I've read it and reread it and studied and thought about it. And, and Jesus is explaining who he is really for the first time for the first time he's he's trying to put into words who he really is in a way that men can begin to comprehend it and yet they can't when he ends up here at the end he says you don't even understand you don't you don't know god you don't know his words and you don't understand i know not in disgust or discouragement, but it's just, it's that what he is trying to communicate to these people and to us because it's written down for us. It's just so far beyond human words 
and a human ability to to communicate. I'm just saying to you this morning is that Jesus is way more than any of us think he is. And what he done is way more than any of us have ever begun to comprehend. He forgave me my sins. Hallelujah. But that's only the beginning of what he done. Let's read it. Let's read verses 36 through 47. That's quite a bit, but that's not, you know, that's not all of it. I'm skipping over a bunch here. He said, But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And that's what I really want to preach about this morning. These works that the Father gave him to finish. They are the testimony of who he is. That's very important. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard the voice at any, heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Isn't that strange way of putting it. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent uh, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For the words, uh, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how? But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So we'll stop right there. Uh, there's another verse I want to read. A couple of verses in John chapter 14. Maybe I'm getting them out of order here, but I'm going to go ahead and read it anyway. John 14. Believest thou? Not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Now this is on down the road. This is what these disciples see. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. The works, the works. What is he talking about? Well, I'm going to say a few things. Probably be quick. The works of Christ, which the Father gave him to finish, that he mentioned there in the beginning of our reading, went, they were more than just turning water into wine and healing a few sick folks. That's not the works that the Father gave him to finish. When his work was finished, what did he say? It is finished. That's the work that the Father gave him to finish. And that's the work that testifies of who he is. The works he's referring to here are the works that provided the atonement for sin and the way of redemption for mankind. There couldn't have, couldn't have been any other way. There was no other way. No hope for you or me. Do you understand that? That without him, we were headed for hell and destruction, eternal damnation. He came that we might have life. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That means that if he hadn't come, we'd have been lost. He didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. 
the plan of redemption from the beginning of time was about his was about to be displayed here openly on this earth in the sight of men and completed in the life and death and burial and resurrection of the Son of God. And see, we're in John chapter 5, and this is the first time that we have it recorded where Jesus is explaining who he is. He's in the Father, the Father's in him. The works we talked about last week, the works of God and the works of man, and that the fact that these works you see are the works of the Father. They're not of me because I and the Father are one. You're just, if you see me, you've seen the Father. What you're seeing here is God among you so that you can perceive who He is, what He's like. And that's what these things are about. This is what He's declaring. Jesus is declaring that this was going to prove who He was. These works were going to be the undeniable witness of the fact that he was indeed the Son of God and one with the Father. And like we mentioned, I think, last week, there's never been another human being like Jesus Christ before or since. Nobody's ever set a foot on this earth that even compares to his influence on mankind and on history. He made more of a mark than any man has ever made on this earth. That's right. And that's undeniable. Yes. The skeptics, the atheists, the, the worst, the most darkened soul on earth cannot deny that fact. He changed the world. Right. The world was changed because He came. Yes, and so... What he did when he was here was so different than any other man has ever done or ever will do is so obvious. What was it that he done? What was it so different about him? Well, never man spake like this man. His words were different, that's for sure. He was, he was different in a lot of ways that men knew and didn't know at that time. Very few knew that he was born of a virgin at that time. They said that, but they didn't believe that. Jesus was declaring that this work that he was going to finish, his identity or genuineness could not be established with the testimony of men or even his own testimony. Because he said here in these scriptures, he said, that he couldn't testify of himself. If I testify of myself, don't mean anything. If you just hear it from a man's lips, that don't mean anything. He talks about John. And we'll get to that in just a second here. But, but a man, his identity or genuous is not established by the testimony of a man or men or even his own testimony, but by the finished work of Christ as the redeemer of man. That's why when he, when he, just before he gave up the ghost, just before he died, he said it is finished. It is finished. He finished the course. He did, he completed, he fulfilled, he finished the works that God, the Father, sent him to do. Yep. <clears throat> It proved who he was. Right. It's good enough for a Roman centurion that stood by and said, surely this was the Son of God. It was good enough for him. Yeah. It ought to prove it to so many more. That, and only in eternity are we going to be able to see who all of that day really believed mm -hmm. yes. when it was finished. Yeah. Because there were a lot of them. There were a lot of the multitude that cried, crucify him, that later believed. Because his works proved. This, these works, not, not the healing and the miracles and the water and the wine and calming the sea and all of that. Those miracles were not meant to prove his identity. Get to that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, I'm right at it there. 
The miracles he did in the sight of men did not in themselves prove that he was the Son of God. Other men work miracles or appear to work miracles. Is that right? The devil can make it appear. That mir- I mean, in the last times, we're warned in Revelation that that's the way it's going to happen. The false prophet and the beast, there's going to be, they're going to perform miracles in the sight of men. The miracles were not. That was not their purpose at all. The miracles that Jesus performed or accomplished. They were to show the heart of the Father toward men. That He was kind and merciful and loving and full of compassion. They were fulfillment of the prophecies of Christ as He came to reveal the Father of His compassion. He came to heal the sick, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. All of that. That's what those miracles were about, wasn't it? Sure it was. <laughs> if you're laying on a bed for 38 years, you're pretty much a captive, aren't you? Yes, sir. And when you get up and walk away and carry it away with you, you're free. You're freed. All those things were meant to show the heart of God toward men because men have this, this, this tendency to... Believe God is just this. Look at all the pagans. Their gods are mean and vengeful and violent and killers and they're going to get you. I mean, all you got to do, you got to sacrifice all you can. You got to do whatever you can to keep them, keep them happy because they'll kill you if you cross them. And they get to thinking of God the Father the same way. And I've heard him, I've heard it preached in Baptist churches the same way. God the Father is, he'll kill you. It's just a good thing Jesus is there because he won't let him kill you. That's the way they come up, the, distort the gospel. Well, Jesus and the Father are one. Without those miracles, the world's attention wouldn't have been on him, would they? I mean, what if he just was a teacher that just taught good Bible lessons and and everybody came to listen, but he didn't do any miracles, would, would the attention of the world have been on him so much? What caused the ruckus every time? Did he go in the Sabbath day and say, y'all are a bunch of reprobate, you bunch of Jews? Did he do that? No, no he went in there and healed somebody on the Sabbath. Because <laughs> that's when they were all there to see it. And it was the Lord's day. <laughs> that got the attention. It also brought it brought the things down on him. Those it was the miracles combined with the words he spake that led to his crucifixion. So they were a necessary part of God's plan. Do you see? He did the miracles. Yes, he did. He did it to show the goodness of God, and it was a part of the whole thing to bring the world's attention to who he was. Now. John chapter 5 verse 35 there, he said about John the Baptist, he said he was a burning and a shining light and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. John was a witness of the truth Jesus said here. John was a witness of who he was. Remember? John, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He did, said it twice at least that it's recorded in John. So John was a witness to who he was. Did he say, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God? No, he didn't say that. What did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God. That's very important. Which taketh away the sin of the world. John was a witness. That's good. But Jesus said, I don't receive the witness of men. You know, that men, that was good for a while. He was a shine, burning in a shining light. And you were, you were content, you were willing for a season to rejoice in His light. But that passed. Now the witness, the witness of who Jesus is, is not lying in a grave somewhere. They didn't cremate Him. The witness, the evidence, the proof, of who he is. <laughs> it's, it's forever 
there for the world to see forever and ever through eternity. See, it's hard to get to express what I'm trying to express this morning. John was a burning and a shining witness, and the miracles were a witness. But the greater witness of the fact that Jesus was God in the flesh are the works that He finished on the cross. Now, our concept of Christ should be more than the commonly repeated cliches that we hear all the time from shallow Christians and the world. Don't you agree with that? Our concept of Him should be highly exalted, out of our reach, instead of making Him so common as us. When we think of Jesus, we shouldn't think of a man who lived and died 2,000 years ago. Do you, do you get me there? Don't think of him as a past tense story that happened back there. It was a life that was lived. and that was, He was a great prophet. That's what the Muslims believe. A lot of other religions believe that. We should not dwell on only one or a few of his attributes or works or promises. We got that, uh, or offices also. We've got that tendency to just focus on one aspect of what he did. You know, the elementary things. Therefore, leaving the doctrines of Christ. Let us go on. See, the doctrines of salvation is what is what is the thing most everywhere and if you go to a baptist church you just pick one out around here and go to it what are you going to hear this morning if if they're still preaching and they're not just having a concert they'll preach on hell and heaven and how you if you want to go to heaven you better repent of your sins get to this altar and today may be your last chance and and Jesus will forgive you if you'll ask him to come into your heart and save you now is that right does, well that's what is being preached but I mean is that really does that really does that convey what we're reading about here this morning no, 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 no. Misses the mark by a million miles. What does the church need to do? The churches. Our church. What do we need to do when we come together? What, what needs to be the theme of everything? Well, Jesus. What should be the theme of the songs we sing? Jesus. Now, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's nothing wrong with songs that say other things but we when we get a steady diet of that and nothing these songs we just sing you know think of the hymns I've been thinking of some this week you know oh my holy 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 is the Lord God almighty I've got a I've got in my bible software that all of Isaac Watts hymns mercy he wrote a lot of hymns yeah. And there's very few of them that aren't good. The theme is the same in all of them. You know what the theme is? God! His greatness, His majesty, His holiness. He's same with John Newton. He wrote a lot of hymns. A lot of those. And, and let me point something out to you. You say, well, that was just a thing. You know, you got these modern people who... They don't know history. They just reach back here and grab a thing or two to argue with about. They say they were contemporary in their time. Oh, now you just better back up there. Not necessarily. The great hymn writers did come along in the 16, 1700s, early 1800s. Mid 1800s, there were still some, but then during that time, it began to change. The theme began to change. But do you realize, I mean, do you have an overall view of history of the church and of God's work since Christ to now to realize that there was an enlightenment that happened in this world? 
About the same time, those hymn writers started writing those hymns. And they became the songs of the church. Do you understand that? <clears throat> there were the dark ages. I know they don't teach history anymore. Y'all are supposed to be getting a Christian education and I hope you're getting enough to realize and to learn some history of the, of the church and to know how this thing has all folded, unfolded here. But there was a dark time from just a few hundred years after Christ was on this earth until that enlightenment started. They taught me in public school, you know, it was called the Renaissance. And they focused on the art and all of that kind of stuff. And, but that's not really what it was about. When was the world evangelized? In, in 1000 A.D.? No, that was the dark ages. It was dark. When, when light came, so did the songs about God, yes. exalting God. All these hymns that try, I mean, give a best effort to try to exalt God with our words in song. A little bit of what he deserves. A little bit of his glory. I think that's what this, I think that's what we see right here. We shouldn't dwell on only one or a few of the attributes or works or offices or promises of Christ. And people, we tend to do that. Some people focus on the fact that he's coming again. I know people that ain't, they're not about anything but prophecy. That's all they want to talk about. That's what their whole ministry is about. They're unbalanced. They become wackos because they're leaving out the most, the most important thing. Christ must be exalted. He must be preeminent in everything. In our thoughts, in our lives, in our, in our path, everything. In our worship must be Him because of who He is and what He's done. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, listen to this, may be able to comprehend. Are you able to comprehend anything of what we're trying to get across this morning? Do you ever just sit around and think about God, what He did? In becoming a man. How he died. How he conquered death. How he's coming again. Do you ever. Do you ever anticipate in your mind. Being in his presence. In his very presence. Do you look. Do you ever think of those things. So this is what it's about. Grounded in love. May be able. With all saints may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. It goes beyond what you know. You can't know enough <coughs> to know Him, to understand Him. To get a real grasp on who he is. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that is Ephesians. Chapter 3 verse 17 through 19. That's telling us what it means to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to be acquiring a wider, longer, deeper higher understanding of who he really is and what he really came to do. He's the promised woman. You know, I've read commentators and stuff and everybody agrees. Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy of Christ. I think I see it in there before that. I think I see it in Genesis chapter 1. I do. He's the promised one. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
I mean, He is the promised one, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He's our Passover. He's the sacrifice for our sin. He's the propitiation, the atonement, the fulfillment of the law. He's the Redeemer of mankind. Think about that. Nobody else wears that title. No other religion, no other cult leader, nobody else in all of history has ever been given that name, that title, Redeemer. He is our Redeemer. That's what He came to do. That's the work, the works that the Father gave Him to finish. (laughs) <laughs> the garden was part of it. I believe that's where the battle was really won. You want to read the, the Lord's Prayer? Read John chapter 17 and read what He said. That's when it was... He's the Redeemer of mankind and therefore, since He's the Redeemer of mankind, He is the Judge of mankind. In verses 27 through 30, you know, we could back up there and read that. We won't, but but God's given Him the judgment. He's the Judge. Christ is the Judge. Do we understand that? Yes, sir. He is rightfully the Judge of every man and woman that's ever lived or going to live. John chapter nine and verse, uh, 19 and verse 30, pardon me. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Do you realize that's only in the book of John? I was thinking about this. The other, the other Gospels talk about all the things Jesus did and said. John talks about Jesus. Who He was. You don't find this here in John chapter 5. You don't find it in the other Gospels like this. So clear. So John, thank God for John. He was able to write down what Jesus said in trying to explain Himself for who He was. All that was required to reconcile God and man was accomplished by the death of Christ on the cross. Listen to me closely here. I can read the Scriptures. uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son... So we were reconciled, we're reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Very important theological fact. The Bible says it very plainly, lays it out there. How are we reconciled to God? By the death of Jesus Christ. His blood represented His life, which was given for us. That's what we do when we, t- when we have the Lord's Supper. We remember that fact. That's the things He wanted us to remember. His body that was broken and His blood that was shed. We're reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things concerning to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He had to be like us in order to be able to make reconciliation for our sins. He He came here. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He suffered and he died without sin. So he was the sacrifice. He's our Passover without spot or blemish or any fault whatsoever. 
His resurrection from the dead did not atone for sin. We need to make that distinction there. The resurrection from the dead is not the atonement for sin. Real important. It's the result of the atonement for sin. This is important. You don't read this in theology books. I never have. I've never had anybody explain it. But it's absolutely the way. We're we're saved, we're reconciled by His death, and we're saved by His life. Because I live, you shall live also. The resurrection is the result of the atonement for sin. Jesus rose from the dead because death had been abolished. Because the atonement for sin had been made and finished. And you, you realize that death came by sin. And, and death passed upon all men because of sin. Romans chapter 12, or 5, verse 12. is so misconstrued most of the time. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Fact. What's the problem? Sin. What's the result of sin? Death. That's the curse. The whole universe. What is the law of thermodynamics? Everything's dying. (laughs) That God didn't create it that way. It was not in God's perfect creation there was no death there was no curse there was no pain no sorrow no sickness sorrow was not there that was added because of sin death came to sin death passed upon all men because of sin therefore sin now being atoned for meant that all men would be resurrected amen it's a, it's a distortion that the devil's able to do with so many people. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how foggy that is in everybody's mind. Why well, you just get, if you, the same people are going to get resurrected and they don't think about the, everybody else. No, no. All the dead are going to stand before God. Yes. All of them. I mean, the sea is going to give up the dead. Death and hell are going to give up the dead. Everything above the earth, below the earth, everywhere. All the dead that ever lived are going to stand before God. And it's going to be as if death never happened because death has been abolished. And we're waiting now for the redemption to wit of the body. We're waiting to the completion of this thing. And we've got the seal, the earnest of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, all not all are going to be resurrected to eternal life but some to eternal damnation who refuse to receive Christ as the atonement for sin. See, that's where these universalists get mixed up and a lot of other people, they think everybody's going to heaven because Christ died for the sins of all men. No, here's what Jesus said back up here in verse 25 through 29. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. And now is. This is in the same scripture we're reading here. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, who's the dead? That's the dead. That's everybody that's dead. He didn't make any distinction between saved people and lost people who were dead. The dead are going to hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father, you say, well, His people will hear His voice. Now, wait a minute. He's going to clarify that in a minute. For as the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given to the Son to have life in Himself and hath given Him authority to execute judgment also because He is the Son of Man Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice. Does that make it clear enough? Mm -hmm. Everybody. And shall come forth. Ain't nobody going to stay in the grave when when He calls. You know, they said, somebody said that one time, I thought it's kind of funny, but it's really true. When He went to the tomb of Lazarus, He didn't say, come forth, because everybody would have came forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. 
Does that make sense to you? Yes. You, you believe that? I do. Because that's what this scripture is saying. All but hear his voice. <laughs> He's going to say to everybody that ever lived, come forth. What about that? Everybody's going to understand that's me when they hear that voice. They're not going to be able to say, well, he didn't call me. When he says, everybody that's in the grave will hear his voice and shall come forth. But here's what they're going to come forth to. Some, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, John 11, you know where we're at? We're at the tomb of Lazarus. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. She had just said, I know that one day in the resurrection, he'll come forth. My brother will live again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the... Yes, man... How do you explain that? He jumped out of time. He ignored time right here. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Romans chapter 8 verse 22 tells us the whole creation. The effects of sin, man's sin, have affected more than we even begin to imagine. I really believe that. The Bible says the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. I believe that means exactly what it says. The whole creation. Yes. Everything has been affected by man's sin. Much more than we realize that it has. Mm -hmm. Everything on earth is chasing and killing one another. That's true. Every kind of life is affected by that. By death. And killing. Yes. Jesus atoned for all of that. If the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain until now... What's the promise there? Is that just sad fact that he's sharing with us or is there a promise there? Waiting for the redemption to wit of the body. What Jesus did on the cross did more to fix... I mean, it did enough to fix everything. The atonement is, is sufficient to fix everything that man's sin has wrecked. Not just barely enough to get sinful men into heaven, but not out of their sin. That's why I think that's such a it's a it's an abomination and it's a it's heresy to teach that Jesus and his atonement is insufficient to deliver you from living a life of sin. I hate that. Because it's damning souls. Yes, sir, it is. Jesus came, what Jesus came to do is to fix it all and clean up the whole thing and to restore it to its original divine design. Do y'all know that's where we're headed to? When God created everything in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it was very good. You know what he said? Very good. It was perfection. Tragedy happened. It was all wrecked, corrupted, polluted. There was no corruption. There was no pollution. There was no, no hatred, no pain, no sorrow, no death. And for the last... Almost 6,000 years, that's what it's been. That's what life has been like. Unbelievably cruel. The, the things that people have done to one another and to the animals as well. And the animals to one another. Everything's at war. 
Jesus came to fix that. That's why I like to think about that new Jerusalem descent. I mean, heaven and earth have passed away. We see that new Jerusalem descending out of God, from God out of heaven. And it's and then we get then we're told what it's gonna be like there. It's gonna be like God meant for it to be in the beginning. Sin's gonna be banished. Evil is going to be banished forever. How did that happen? How could that happen? It could not have happened without Christ coming to this earth as a man, living and suffering and being shamed and and ridiculed and spit upon and crucified for our sin. It fulfilled the law of God. It met the demands of justice and righteousness. There's so many aspects about it and it gets it's easy to get them twisted if you're not very careful. Jesus didn't pay for our sins. He gave Himself for our sins. He gave Himself for us. He bore our sins in His own body on the tree. He didn't become a sinner. He bore our sins. See, that's so wrong. I've heard it preached by Baptists that he became a murderer. He became a thief. He became a homosexual. No, he did not. He was the Holy Son of God. He was God. He didn't become all that. He bore all that. In His own body. For you. And for me. And that's the miracle of of it all. That's the testimony. That's what tells us who He really was. That's why the cross is that symbol that's known worldwide. Now, they've got a lot of misconceptions. It's been misrepresented. It's been distorted in its meaning and everything. And I know that. But still, it's the cross. Yes, sir. It's associated with who? Mohammed? Confucius? No, the cross is Jesus Christ. They crucified the Prince of Life. And it proves that that's the testimony that'll never be undone. It'll never be overridden. That's why they try, they try, they try as hard as they can to prove that He was not who He said He was and they cannot do it because of that testimony right there. The works that He finished that His Father sent Him. Why did He send Him to this world? To make the atonement for sin. The only hope for mankind. That's right. That's right. Amen. And they can't deny it. No. They can't deny it because of the facts that it happened yes. and all that it's, how it's changed human history since then. Yes. We're all witnesses of Him. Just like the apostles were. Yep. We're, Peter told them, we are witnesses of these things. That story, the, the story, the, the thing that happened has not faded away into history. How many wars? How many empires? How many famous people? How many talented people? How many great escapades have men done through all of these millennia that have just vanished and nobody even remembers them? They're digging up places all the time. These great big statues and rocks. Somebody did some big thing there, but nobody even knows who it was or how that happened anymore. They ain't that away with the cross. It ain't that away with it with Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. I'm sure. Are you sure? Yes. What he did is enough to convince me. It's enough to reveal enough about him to me. So that's all I want. I don't want no other kind of religion. I don't want no other kind of nonsense. He is enough. Christ is all I need. All I need. Is He all you need? I hope so. 
Let's worship and honor the Lord and give Him the glory that's due and not be shallow and light and irreverent when we pray or gather together in His name. Let's remember who He is. Let's remember that He's the reason, not just for the season, but He's the reason we're here this morning. He's the reason for everything we do. When we're driving nails and screws and getting splinters in our hands out here, that's about Him. That's not about anything else. It's so that somebody can know who He is. Father, thank You. Wish I could do a better job. Lord, bless Your name. We sure don't give You the honor that's due unto Your name. Help us, Lord, to focus our eyes more upon Thee. Lord, help us to sing unto Thee. Oh, Lord, reveal it to hearts that may be listening who don't understand this. Help them to realize it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's not about knowing religious stuff. It's not about religious writs or duties or, or ceremonies. It's about the Son of God who gave Himself for us. Help us, Lord, to realize that. And show it, I pray, to somebody and through this message in Jesus' name. Amen.